My name is Christopher Gee, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies, and I'm the lead researcher organizing this conference. The Perspectives Conference is the Institute of Policy Studies flagship conference held every year in January. As you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has meant that we are unable to gather this many people into a single room, but the dislocations have come with it, have presented us with the opportunity to reconfigure this conference, bring it online, and expand our reach to more Singaporeans and friends of Singapore, both here and overseas. It is also an integral part of a larger exercise that the Institute is undertaking called Reimagining Singapore 2030, more about which I will share with you on the final day of the conference on the 25th of January. The Perspectives Conference will consider three broad themes, each anchored by phrases from the Singapore Pledge. Day one today is on the economy, and we will be considering our prosperity and progress. Day two is this Thursday the 14th, and will be on society and how we achieve happiness based on justice and equality. The third day is next Tuesday, the 19th of January, and we will be talking about politics and governance, how to build a democratic society. There will be three separate sessions on each of the first three days of the conference, and the discussions that we have in all of the nine sessions will then be brought to the plenary sessions held on the final day. Our first session today is in the economy track and is entitled Jobs and Skills. Before I introduce the moderator and hand the session over to him, please allow me to run through some brief administrative details. Please submit your questions for the panelists via pigeonhole in the question submission section on this forum's page. You can do this at any time during the session. We invite all at our conference to contribute to our discussions in a respectful and safe manner, focused on the issues at hand. IPS reserves the right to act in a way to ensure that this is always the case in all of the chat or Q&A functions in our conference site. I have one more announcement to make. Unfortunately, uh, there's been a demise in Mr. Lam E. Young's family, and he regrets he is unable to be on this panel today as a discussant. He sends his apologies and wishes us all the best for the session today. I'm sure we will all join together in offering our sincerest condolences to him and his family for their loss. This session will be moderated by Professor Danny Kwa, Lee Kashing Professor of Economics and Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And he will lead the discussions in the session today with the speakers and discussant. Prof Danny, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Good day and welcome everyone. My name is Danny Kwa and it's my privilege to get to moderate this IPS Singapore Perspectives Conversation on the economy and on jobs and skills in particular. Now, obviously, COVID-19 is making us do all this via telepresence, in contrast to the usual large Marina Bay Sands grand ballroom gatherings that previous IPS Singapore perspectives have gotten to enjoy. But we've also been able, therefore, to broaden the audience. I want to remind everyone that given the circumstances that we're doing this, I want to encourage as many questions as possible, but you do have to submit them via online pigeonhole. As Chris has already described, and as appears, the URL of which appears elsewhere on your screen. Returning to the topic at hand, more broadly, the COVID-19 global pandemic, it's been the kind of profound global disruption that makes us rethink and recalibrate our understanding of many things, including social organization, economic life, international engagement. By itself, this disruption would already be profound and fundamental. But this pandemic has also come at a time when from different, very disparate sources, we were already starting to question some very basic principles, rules that for the last several decades had usefully guided our lives and our livelihoods, national prosperity and progress all around the world. These principles included, well, first, a rules-based open international system that allowed nations both security and the transparency of intent on a level playing field. 
it inc they included globalization, that ever increasing ease with which everything became available to more and more of us wherever we were on the planet at lower and lower cost. These principles included growth for the many, a rising economic activity that drew everyone into gainful employment and through that lifted all, even though we figured small pockets of humanity might continue to need just that little bit of kickstart assistance to catch up in a sustained way with everyone else. Now, COVID-19 struck in the middle of resets we were all already doing on these issues. This pandemic tore into the frayed edges around which we had been worrying. And rather than allow us the relative luxury of looking to solve each of these problems in isolation, the pandemic in one go smashed together and then smashed up entire swaths of these positive arcs in our lives and our livelihoods. The central narrative, the challenge going forwards, how can we best build a fresh grand narrative of prosperity, uplift and hope for everyone? Among the most consequential of these new arcs we all have to consider that we face both pressure and opportunity to rebuild. What will the full range of all of our people now do to be productive with their time, given the rewiring that is happening in social and economic activity? What will they do, whether it is activity that brings in sustenance and well being for their families, regular steady incomes? Activity that gives them pride and satisfaction at the end of each day. Or activity that gives them a sense of dignity and identity that allows them to engage positively with others like themselves. In other words, what jobs will people have? What skills will they need to bring to that engagement? What are the challenges that people everywhere are going to face in effectively navigating this coming jobs and skills landscape. That is the problem that we're discussing in this first session of Singapore Perspectives. I'm very much looking forward to the ideas and solutions our panel and our discussion will surface on these. Each panelist will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll have five minutes for the discussion to respond to what's been said and add further points from her own perspective. Following those, we will have time for a general group discussion, as well as Q&A with the audience. I'm now going to hand over to the floor, but just before I do that, let me take a couple of seconds and say a few words about each of our speakers. First up, we're going to have Senior Minister Taman Shanmugaratnam. In Singapore, Taman serves as Coordinating Minister for Social Policies, as Chair for the National Jobs Council, as chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Internationally, Taman chairs the Group of 30, the Global Education Forum, and the Advisory Board for the UN Human Development Report. After Taman's opening statement, I'm going to invite Professor Tyler Cohen to take the floor. Tyler is Holbert L. Harris Chair of Economics at the Center for Study of Public Choice at George Mason University. He's also a distinguished senior fellow at the Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. He writes the daily economics blog, Marginal Revolution, and founded the online educational platform, Marginal Revolution University. Following those two opening statements, I will ask Selena Ling to share her responses to them, as well as inject further points that her unique perspective brings to our discussion. Selena is, as you know, Chief Economist at OCBC Bank and Head of Treasury Research and Strategy at OCBC Global Treasury Division. Senior Minister Taman, over to you, sir. Thanks very much, uh, Danny, and thanks for having me on this panel. Very happy to be together with um, Professor Cohen and Selena Ling. 
Um, I think as Danny has um, uh, very well, uh, has very succinctly uh, put it, we are dealing with both <clears throat> the crisis brought about by COVID, as well as a <clears throat> whole set of changes that predated COVID and are now being accelerated by COVID. So we essentially have to do two things at the same time. We have to recover from this crisis, help individuals recover, communities recover, and help whole economies recover. But we've also got to gear ourselves for a future that's already unfolding before us. New supply chains, new ways in which goods are being purchased and delivered, and a future of work that has already arrived. That's the basic challenge. What's our objective? Our objective should be to first ensure that we have enough jobs for our people, but very important too, too that we have a broader distribution of good jobs, jobs that pay fairly, jobs that provide some security, and jobs that provide people with a sense of satisfaction from being able to be active, from being able to contribute. We need that broader distribution of good jobs, even in the future labor market, with all the challenges that it brings of digitization, automation, and increased global competition for many white collar jobs. So that's our objective. Make sure we have enough jobs in the economy and make sure we have a broader distribution of good jobs. How we react to the crisis does also shape how well we do over the longer term. That's a very important uh, uh, observation you'd make about uh, how countries perform over the long term. Dealing well with crises does shape your long-term trajectory. And there are many reasons for it. Uh, the reasons are well understood as far as individuals and labor markets are concerned, because if you don't, if you allow, if people are unemployed for long periods of time, there is scarring of what the economists call hysteresis. Skills fade, the aptitude for jobs fails, fades, and the interest of employers in individuals fades the longer that they remain unemployed. And what's true for individuals is also true for whole sectors in an economy. And if you don't deal well with crisis, you'll often find that it's not just the weakest firms and the least efficient firms that go out of business. Uh, you also lose some very good viable firms. So crisis management is an important attribute for long-term performance as well. And it means that as we deal with COVID, we've got to deal with this shock to the labor market as effectively as we can, and do it in a way that anticipates the changes that are coming. Anticipate the changes that COVID is fast forwarding. We have put a lot of effort into getting helping people to bounce back as quickly as possible. We've had an increase in unemployment. We, together with some other economies, have had relatively low unemployment uh, in normal times, running at about 3% or slightly above 3%. Uh, Hong Kong is somewhat similar. The US, amongst advanced countries, has had relatively low unemployment rates. In fact, all around that same range, if you look at it pre-COVID, just a little bit above 3%. Had we had the same increase in unemployment, in unemployment rates that the United States had had, or even Hong Kong, which, is, which has had relatively low unemployment, but if we had the same increase in Singapore in our unemployment rate that we've seen in the United States or Hong Kong, we would have had substantially greater numbers of Singaporeans unemployed. What we have seen is that on top of a normal level of unemployed of about 70,000 people, which even in a healthy economy, uh, 
is the case because there's a lot of frictional unemployment, people moving in and out of jobs. On top of that, we've seen another 40,000 people unemployed. So today we have 110,000 people unemployed. If we had seen what, if we had experienced the increase in unemployment rate that Hong Kong had, we would have had about 70,000 more people unemployed. If we'd seen the increase in unemployment rate that the United States had, we would have had about 250,000 more people unemployed. So that illustrates the importance of the matter. React quickly, react effectively to stem the increase in unemployment, but also to get people who do get out of a job back into a job as quickly as possible. The job's not done. We still have heightened unemployment. We still have that significant increase in the number of people who are looking for jobs, and we've got to do our level best to help them. We've got to do it in a way that doesn't just put people back at work as quickly as possible, but also tries to find the best match for their skills and for the human capital that they've built up over time. It's not often going to be the same job or the same type of job, but as much as possible, we should find jobs that are adjacent to what they've been doing or jobs that can make the best use of the skills they've accumulated over time. And there's always this tension when it comes to job matching exercises, a tension between wanting to get the fastest match, in other words, get someone back into a job as quickly as possible, and trying to get someone into a job that will help him or her keep building on their human capital, and at least not suffer a very significant loss in human capital, where they start doing a job where much of what they've accumulated before in their skills and experience is, is irrelevant. And the way to achieve both, the way to achieve speed of job matching so that people don't stay unemployed for a long time and, and find that their skills fade, and at the same time, get a good match for the skills and aptitudes they have. The way, of, the way to achieve both is through high quality and effective coordination. You can't leave it to the market. If you leave it to the market, a significant group of people will find that it takes too long for them to find jobs. And the matches are often highly imperfect because labor markets are famous for imperfect information. The matching of skills from a past job to the skills required for a new job and the upgrading of skills required for a new job is not something that markets on their own firms on their own do very well. So the quality and effectiveness of coordination when people lose their jobs, and ideally before people lose their jobs, to prepare them for new jobs is now a basic institutional capability that every modern economy must have. And our ability to bounce back from crises depends on that capability. It's not just a government capability, it's a capability of partnership between businesses, unions, community, and government. And we have to keep improving it. And I can tell you that in Singapore, in this crisis, we've learned a lot from how we've handled the past crises we've been through, and we've improved on it further. Coordination in helping people to get back into the workplace, stay enthusiastic, stay optimistic, and be able to build on the human capital they've accumulated is a very important institutional capability that we've got to keep building on. And we're working very hard at it. Second, we've got to press on the accelerator on lifelong learning. In other words, it's not just about dealing with the shock of COVID and the shock of unemployment, but it's about constant upskilling when you do have a job, constant upskilling in normal times. That's also helpful when you prepare for the next crisis that comes, which is usually something you never predict. Because if you keep upskilling, keep broadening your skills while you're at work, it also helps you prepare for the tumbles that inevitably come. It's just like sports. If you haven't been training, your chances of getting injured 
when you take a fall and finding it difficult to come back up and play like normal are much higher. It's the ones who are con continually training or able to avoid injury when they fall and who can spring back up and continue. So continuous learning on the job is a critical requirement for the future. And it's a challenge everywhere in the world. Some countries have a stronger tradition of it, the Nordics, several other Northern European countries, but everywhere you look, including in, in Northern Europe, there is a great inequality of participation in lifelong learning. And ordinary blue collar workers have a much lower rate of participation. It's usually strong at the outset when you have apprentice scheme, apprenticeship schemes, and people are starting off work. But once they are mid-career, the participation of blue collar workers in lifelong learning is much lower than it is for knowledge-based professionals. You don't have to tell the knowledge-based professionals what to do. They know it's in their interest and they internalize the returns that come out of investing in learning. But we have to make a significant push in our lifelong learning efforts, what we call skills future in Singapore, to help ordinary people learn conveniently, learn in a way that's related to their careers, learn to do better on the job today, but also to prepare for future careers. And that requires, again, coordination. It requires a whole set of institutions that we are developing around skills future. And it requires support from the state because employers on their own will typically want to train their workers for today's job to be as efficient as possible for today's job. They don't have a particular incentive to train workers for their next career. And that's why we need public-private co coordination. We need the unions involved so that we find the right balance between helping firms have a competitive and skilled workforce for today and helping individuals stay competitive for the future. And that balance comes by having a mix of both approaches, strong support for firms for skills upgrading of their workforces, but also strong support for ind individuals to be able to reinvent themselves and move on to other jobs in the future. It's something which we are now doing in an enhanced fashion. What's happened during COVID has strengthened our capabilities of coordination. It's also seen a stronger spirit of partnership, I would say, between businesses, unions, and government. And what we're doing with COVID has to outlast COVID. It's an advantage for the long term as well. Next, we have the challenge of raising incomes at the bottom of the ladder, a very important objective. We have seen significant improvement over the last decade. In fact, if you look at workers at the 20th percentile of the income distribution, those at the lower rungs of the income ladder, uh, they've seen an increase of about 40% in their incomes in real terms over the last decade. Part of that was a catch up from the previous decade because the first decade of the 2000s was a tough decade for low income workers. We had uh, two recessions or two and a half recessions and downturns have a way of being hardest on those who are further down the income ladder. That's in the nature of downturns. So that was a tough first decade. And we've caught up in the second decade. They've had significant income growth. In fact, their incomes have grown faster than the median. But when we think about the gap between those at the bottom of the ladder and those in the middle, or even those higher up the ladder, Remember that in Singapore, the issue is quite different from that in many other advanced countries, which have seen stagnating median incomes for a long period of time. In our case, the challenge is more pronounced because the middle income group has seen a very significant lift in incomes, which is a mark of success in our economic strategies and our whole system of education and skills upgrading. Median incomes in Singapore grew by 
65% in the last two, two decades, 65%. About half of it in this decade, half of it in the first decade of the 2000s. 65% lift in incomes, median incomes. And that means that the level of median incomes today in Singapore is actually above that in most advanced countries, adjusted for PPP so that you can compare it in real terms. Even if you give significant allowance for measurement imprecisions in PPP, even if you give a good margin for imprecisions, we have now median incomes that are in the uppermost tier of advanced countries. The Swiss and the Norwegians are at the top, but the median income in Singapore in real terms, compared across countries, it's higher than the United States, higher than the United Kingdom, higher than most European countries, and well above Japan, Korea, and Hong Kong, which are relatively advanced Asian societies. And that's a challenge. Our middle-income group has done well, it's moved up, and the challenge now is to make sure that those lower down are not left too far behind. They've seen a very significant lift in the last decade, but we've got to lift their wages further. We've got to re-rate blue-collar jobs in the interests of a cohesive society. And we've got to take advantage of the spirit of solidarity that we've seen renewed in COVID to push ahead and do better for our lowest income workers. It can be done. It requires collective solutions and it requires economic strategies that ensure that you have continued demand for jobs up and down the ladder. And our basic approach is to go for what we call the progressive wage model, which is essentially a minimum wage plus progression, minimum wage plus, together with workfare, which is essentially a negative income tax, what the Americans called earned income tax credit, and economic strategies that ensure that jobs are being created and there's a demand for better jobs over time. And it's that combination, a calibrated minimum wage plus model together with workfare and together with economic strategies to ensure that we stay competitive. And there's a demand not just for high-end professionals, but for a broad spread of workers across our workforce. That's basically our approach. A few words on minimum wages and progressive wage model. These are not concepts which are different philosophically. They are concepts which are different with regard to practical design and application. Economists no longer have a presumption. The majority of economists no longer have a presumption that a minimum wage leads to unemployment. And that applies in our case, not just to a minimum wage proposal, but to the progressive wage model that we are embarking on. There's no longer a presumption that can be made that the minimum rung of the progressive wage model will lead to unemployment. But neither, neither is there a presumption of the opposite. Uh, neither can one make blanket statements that a minimum wage leads to no job loss. What matters is the level of that minimum run. And very importantly, what matters is how it affects the least skilled and most vulnerable in our workforces. We can't talk in terms of aggregates and averages. And I, I'll, I'll say as someone who follows the minimum wage literature very closely, that it is still highly disputed, the effects of higher minimum wages on jobs and in particular on the standard of living of lower income people is highly disputed. The methodologies are disputed for interpreting the evidence and the evidence itself is disputed. So all that can be said is you can't make blanket statements in either direction. What matters is actual design and what matters critically is the context of the least skilled and vulnerable workers that we are truly trying to help. And that varies from one society to another. The situation we have in Singapore is quite different from in many other advanced countries. In, our, in many advanced countries, when they talk about the minimum wage and its effects, they're talking about youngsters typically. 
they are the most vulnerable and they are the ones that there's greatest concern about. In Singapore, it's the other way around. It's our older generation of Singaporeans who did not have a chance to have an education. If you look at the bottom 10% of our workers, half of them are aged above 55. Just remember that half of the bottom 10% of wage earners are above 55. And most of them, two thirds of that group of older low wage workers did not even complete secondary school. They had a primary school education and they didn't complete secondary school. They did not benefit from the transformation in our education system that took place in the 70s and 80s. They had already joined the workforce. That's our Merdeka generation and our pioneer generation before them. But the Merdeka generation and those a little younger than Merdeka still in the workforce, many of them had very limited education. They did simple jobs most of their lives. They saw things improve, but transformation in Singapore led to inequality between the young and the old. And remember now, when we talk about lifting the wages of those lower down, think hard about the capacity of our older workers to be able to switch jobs, to be able to retain a job, and to be able to truly benefit. And that's why we are going about this in a calibrated way. Rather than a simple across the board minimum wage, we are working on it sector by sector, working on it together with our skills upgrading schemes, and working on it in a way that ensures that we get not just a minimum wage, but maximum unemployment. Minimum wage, maximum unemployment. In other words, give people the dignity of holding a job and earning a better wage. That's the dignity that we have to secure. The dignity of being able to work, contribute, and earn a better wage. And it can be done. A sectoral approach is not an odd idea. In fact, most of the Nordic countries and a few others do not have an across-the-board minimum wage. They settle it sector by sector, negotiation between unions and companies. It's not unusual at all. But it is a safer approach in ensuring that we do not sacrifice employment of the lowest skilled and the most vulnerable in our workforce. A second point that's important and not often recognized uh, is that, and it's a benefit of our minimum wage plus model, the progressive wage model, it is that you don't get a situation that way of people getting onto the minimum rung and staying there and staying flat there. If you look at the French, for instance, you find a significant proportion of those who are on the minimum wage in France have been there for a long time. A significant proportion can be 10 years on the minimum wage with no change in their wages because there's a flattening of the wage profile and a flattening of the whole wage order within the firm and within the industry. And that's not ideal either. It's not ideal from the point of view of motivation, not ideal from the point of view of motivating people to keep upgrading their skills and moving up. So these are practical issues. They're not major philosophical differences, but our approach of going for the minimum wage plus through the progressive wage model, coupled by workfare, which is a very important top up to wages that the state provides, plus economic strategies to sustain demand across the spectrum of skills is a very important one. I'll, I'll want to end up by emphasizing the point about economic strategies. If we, you know, we have to understand the basic economic landscape we operate in. The higher skilled end of our workforce is essentially competing increasingly on a global scale for business and for, for jobs. We are increasingly a global hub in a range of sectors, and it's a global competition. We are competing with essentially countries who have relatively high incomes. But at the lower skilled end, it has always been a more regional game. In our case, a game within Asia, where we are competing with a large population of lower wage labor forces. 
And that's a very important fact that the higher skilled end of the workforce is competing globally with countries with higher salaries and incomes. And the lower skilled end has been competing regionally and in Asia. If you leave it purely to labor cost arbitrage to decide on which jobs are in Singapore, you'll find businesses basing their hub operations, their management functions, marketing functions, R&D functions in Singapore, and outsourcing the less skilled work to the rest of Asia. That's an efficient model. And our whole economic strategy is to find a way of countering that, find a way of ensuring that the jobs up and down that skills ladder are sticky in Singapore. How do you provide that stickiness of the middle and lower skill jobs in Singapore, even in the face of competition from the region. And the way to do it is to essentially create for companies the benefits of externalities in Singapore. In other words, whilst the most efficient textbook model may be to outsource the low skill jobs, it's better off to have them here because their advantages in co-locating both the high skilled and middle and low skill jobs. Advantages that come from a whole ecosystem that provides for continuous reskilling, advantages of an ecosystem or ecosystem of first class logistics, and advantages that come from the fact that more companies are doing the same. When more leading companies are in Singapore, you find that the quality of the labor force is itself moving up and everyone benefits. You find that the quality of the services also moves up. So create externalities for companies in Singapore to be able to do a range, to, to hire people for a range of jobs in Singapore and have them more sticky in Singapore. That's the way we deal with globalization. Compete as a whole team rather than compete segment by segment of the workforce. That's essentially our strategy and it's, it's a continuous work by EDB and all our economic agencies. If you look at the companies that are here, Thermo Fisher or Applied Materials or GSK in pharmaceuticals, they're now doing a whole range of work. They've got their R&D functions, they've got their HQ functions, but they've also got manufacturing functions, production operations here, which wouldn't normally be here. And that whole approach is because we're competing as a team in Singapore, not a segment by segment of the workforce. So I'll end there with that point, which is that economic strategies and our ability to run a competitive economy as we move up the value chain is critical to social outcomes. It's critical to the livelihoods of those lower down the income ladder. It's critical to us being able to sustain higher wages, both for the median, for the middle income group, as well as for those in the low income group. Never think that it's simply a matter of fixing the market. You've got to get markets to work well. You've got to give them incentive to be, firms to be in Singapore. And then we've got to also coordinate better. And we've got to have collective solutions that do the fair thing for those lower down on the ladder. And it can be done and we're going to get there. Thanks, Danny. Thank you, SM Tarman. A wonderful opening statement for the rich color and concrete detail that you have given us on the Singapore labor market, the nature of domestic labor market outcomes, and indeed of global competition. You talked about the full court press, the whole team approach that Singapore needs to take to the challenges that are gonna come. And indeed, you began by being very clear about what those challenges were, that we needed to create not just jobs for people, enough jobs for people, but enough good jobs for people, creating jobs across the entire distribution. One of the things that you focused on, which I want to use to lead into Tyler's uh, statement, is that we need your statement, we need coordination. Market forces alone will not suffice on this upgrading and this transition that we're going through. I'd like to invite Tyler to, to share with us his thoughts on not just those issues, but more broadly, 
on the kind of new labor markets and skills that we're going to see. Over to you, Tyler. Can't quite hear you yet, Tyler. Mute. Yeah, gotcha. Very important skill today is unmute. <laughs> I will start with the pandemic and end with Singapore and in between cover the different income classes of the United States. Let me first say, I very much consider myself a friend of Singapore. I loved Tarman's remarks. I'm very sad I cannot be there with you all. I hope I will be able to soon. Now the pandemic. The pandemic has taken so many trends that already were in place and accelerated them, made them faster. But there's one in particular that I think is key for this discussion. And it is this, the pandemic has favored what I call self-organizers. So I am giving this talk from home now for nine months, more than nine months, 10 months. I have been at home almost every day. Maybe I go to the office for two hours and I see my colleagues, the people I work with, half of them are much more productive. No silly meetings, no silly travel. They do what they want, they get more done. And half of them are much less productive. They're at home, they sit on their behinds, they turn on the TV, they worry about the pandemic, whatever, who knows what they do. But they are not self-organizing. So the difference in quality between the, the people who can self-organize and those who cannot, that is just hugely greater than it was before the pandemic. But here's the thing, that was the long run trend anyway. And even after the pandemic is over, that difference is going to stick with us. I think in all countries, but especially in America, here's an obvious difference between America and Singapore. In America, you can live very far from your workplace. And this is happening more and more. I have employees at George Mason. They send me an email, Tyler, I'm moving to Charlotte, North Carolina. What do I say? And I, okay, hope to see you soon, right? Now they're in Charlotte, great. You know, no decline in productivity. That person is a self-organizer. Now from my university to Charlotte, I don't know, it's like a seven hour drive. And I'm like, who cares? This guy is great. It'd be an interesting, but a fun kind of Singaporean game. Like how far can you live from your place of work? Like say you, you work downtown, as many Singaporeans do. Like what's the furthest point in terms of travel time? What's the biggest commute you could create? I don't know, but right, it's not gonna be that long, not like in the US. No one can move seven hours away, maybe another country. <clears throat> but anyway, looking forward, work from a distance is not going away. So, you know, I'll visit Singapore again, but I think two, three, four years from now, we'll also be giving talks to Singapore on Zoom or something else. So this bigger advantage for the self-organizers, this is permanent, it will be intensified, and it will be an opportunity for so many people, but a big, big problem for so many others. Because the question will be, if you are not a self-organizer, well, what is it you do? You sit at home and you're 37% as productive as you used to be when half your colleagues are at work, maybe two days a week, because the office is in Manhattan, rent is crazy, you live in New Jersey two hours away, and you come in two days a week, you'd better be a self-organizer. So that I think looking forward is the main issue. I would just stress this point that Parman made. He presented it as very important. I would like to second it. He called it lifelong learning. I call it retraining yourself. It's the same thing. That is a very important way of being a self-organizer because now technology is changing more rapidly. The internet, biomedicine, many other areas. I don't need to tell all of you. So what you used to know is obsolete 10 years later, maybe five years later. So the more important is retraining or what Tarman called lifelong learning, the greater the gap between the self-organizers and the people who sit on their behinds and watch TV. 
Now, one thing that has always impressed me about Singapore and my many visits, my casual impression is a lot of you are self-organizers. So in relative terms, I would say I'm more bullish on Singapore, uh, in, in some ways more bearish about parts of my own country. Yeah, you know, I live near Washington, D.C. There have been some very strange events here lately. Uh, I cannot avoid mentioning them. And I would just say the people who took over the Capitol building, you can listen to them on YouTube. And I strongly recommend listening to what they have to say. Uh, it is really striking. I think it's a big mistake to consider them stupid. They are saying stupid things, but they are not stupid. In a sense, you have to be somewhat smart, believe stuff that crazy. Here's the thing. Imagine being like a young man, white male, 28 years old, like your future could be okay. When you break into the Capitol, you bring a gun, you seize the chair of Nancy Pelosi, you film yourself, you take selfies. Like what are these people thinking is going to happen to them? So their problem is not IQ. The problem is that they are screwed up. So you could say, like, in some way, they had to self-organize, get on the plane to come to Washington. But the narrative arc of how they see their future, if you watch those videos, it will shock you. And yes, the violence is a problem. The riots were a problem. Insurrection is a problem. I don't mean to minimize that, but the biggest problem behind all that is we have a big chunk of our labor force that cannot self-organize with a time horizon any longer than a few hours. These are people willing to break into a building for fun and they will be sent to federal prison for 10 years. They are not generally stupid. Don't be fooled by the fact that they say stupid things, right? The least intelligent of people, in fact, cannot be tricked by propaganda they don't even know what you're talking about. Tell them about QAnon. They're like, what's QAnon? Tell them about the Federal Reserve. They're like, what's the Federal Reserve? But these are not the least intelligent people. So that is really a big problem. The future for them is not that promising. Civil unrest is one offshoot of that, but it's not the only one. So people in the middle, it's all about retraining and lifelong learning, being better at self-organizing. People at the top in America, also Singapore, have been quite good at self-organizing for a long time, but that matters more. So just top earners are doing very well. You see it on our stock market. You see it in how well tech companies are doing. You see it in many parts of American life. Many of us, in spite of a major recession or depression and an awful pandemic, claiming hundreds of thousands of lives, many of us right now are doing really well. That should, obviously it is for many, many people, it is a shocking fact we are not taking seriously enough because those of us who are doing well are self-organizers. Now, just to close, a few remarks on Singapore. I know you all are Singaporeans. I'm an American. I guess that makes me kind of crazy, but just an impression about how Singapore fits into this picture. First, it seems to me, because of your education system, you have a, a relatively high percentage of self-organizers and because of your culture. And uh, that's wonderful. I think also what I see as your approach to talent is working quite well. So to the world, you are selling predictability, you are selling legal services, you are selling arbitration, you are selling a certain kind of soundness. So as the rest of the world gets split into like those who are self-organizers, those who are not, resulting chaos, there you are, Singapore, with this reputation for reliability. Now, I would say an important fact here, like there is no Singaporean Elon Musk. It's not even an American Elon Musk, right? He's from South Africa. A lot of our best entrepreneurs are immigrants. So the, the recipe of Singapore, I don't think it will ever be Elon Musk think it will be push a lot of your top talent into government, teach them how to work well in teams. And then when your private sector needs support, invite in a lot of capital from multinationals and have a lot of people in your country 
who are really quite talented. No Elon Musk, no Mark Zuckerberg, whoever you want to put on that list, Patrick Collison, maybe not too many of those in Singapore. Your ability to work in teams and boost each other's ability to be self-organizers and focus that in the public sector and be predictable and arbitrate and be sound. Uh, to me, that's very impressive. I think it's going to do very well looking forward. I'm afraid I think my 15 minutes is about up. That's just an overview of what I wanted to say. And I uh, thank you all again so much for inviting me to speak. Thank you very much, Tyler, for that wonderful animated presentation to us on some really important ideas. Key among them is this idea of self-organization. And it'd be really interesting to see how as our conversation proceeds, how we situate that relative to some of the ideas about externalities and spillovers and co-production that SM Taman had also had also talked about. It'd be also interesting to see uh, you expand on this later on in the conversation, Tyler, how you see, uh, how, how broad-based you see this kind of self-organization actually taking hold in the different economies. You mentioned the Elon Musk of the world. And of course, those are very distinct, very small groups of the population. But it'd be interesting to see you expand on these ideas and how we think about them in a broad-based way. So let, let's come back to that. Questions will be coming in on that. Uh, Selena, may I turn to you now for your response to these interesting ideas and also for your own on this issue of jobs and skills. Over to you, Selena. Well, thank you, Danny. Um, thanks to IPS for inviting me as a discussant. I think the insights provided by SM Taman and also Prof Tyler has certainly given me a lot of food for thought. Five minutes is not a very long time, but I'll try and organize my comments around three key points. I think one really is the lessons that we have learned from the COVID-19 on the labor market. The pandemic obviously has accelerated between the gap of the self-organizers and the non-self-organizers, the have, have nots, the skilled versus the low-skilled workers. And I think the displacement that we saw during the global lockdown period last year, particularly for Singapore's case during the circuit breaker, actually has hit the low-income workers hardest. But fiscal support actually have mitigated the fallout. So white collar workers obviously made the transition to work from home arrangements a lot easier. So we did see the unemployment rate uh, for non-PMETs, you know, PMETs, basically the uh, professionals, uh, middle managers uh, type of jobs, actually rise a lot faster than the PMETs and particularly so for particular industries like FMB, aviation, hospitality and entertainment. But we also see the silver lining is that in the subsequent shift to online sales and food and beverage delivery, for instance, non-PMETs uh, actually did benefit from cash and on-call jobs. So there's a little bit of silver lining. We have seen this pandemic come up with both challenges, but also some opportunities. So for Singapore's case, um, as M. Taman mentioned, you know, we have seen the unemployment rate rise to around 3.6% in October. Uh, there has been some stabilization in November. We are a little bit hopeful that it probably has hit a near-term peak. So the worst may be behind us, but I think that the recovery process is going to take a little bit longer. My second point really revolves around different perspectives. I mean, we all share the same goal of wanting to create meaningful jobs, uplifting lives and ensuring a vibrant economy. But what has changed is that employers wish list in the past, their ideal worker was one that was bilingual, educated, hardworking and loyal. But today what they want is cosmopolitan workers with international experience. They are creative, they are able to think out of the box, they have problem solving capabilities. And this is in addition to academic qualifications. So institutes of higher learning actually have to balance between soft and hard skills in order to churn out these resilient, innovative, adaptable risk takers that can bounce back from failure. So if you look at the WEF Future of Jobs survey, what are the top skills that are required in 2025? First would be analytical thinking and innovation. Second is active learning. Third is complex problem solving. Fourth is critical thinking and analysis. And it goes on, top 15 skills required. It says nothing about having STEM quali qualifications, being trained in any occupational uh, skills or anything like that. So I think the challenge really is how we balance between preparing for both hard ground training and also the soft skills that are required to deal with the jobs of the future. From the workers' point of view, the pace of change obviously is accelerating, and that actually gives rise to a sense of 
potentially an inability to cope with some of these changes and hence the insecurity. And from insecurity, you actually get misgivings about foreign competition, right? So will nominal wage continue to rise at a pace that keeps ahead of inflation and particularly asset inflation like housing? Will AI and internet of things replace our jobs? Singapore is actually very fortunate. We do not have a youth unemployment problem, but I think the issue going forward really is how will they continue to enjoy abundant job opportunities that match up with their aspirations, especially during this time of a pandemic recession. I think the approach that has been taken by policymakers in trying to generate internships, apprenticeships, and online uh, attachments is very, very sensible. And then from the country's perspective, how do we continue to raise labor productivity that has been relatively slow? How do we ensure that the aging work, uh, aging population uh, still manages to have a dynamic workforce and the Singapore economy remains vibrant? Okay. I think it's not just about manpower policy per se, but actually broader fiscal and monetary policies also play an integral part. So tax policies, for instance, they help to attract investments that will actually create the jobs even monetary policy, you know, this low for longer kind of uh, interest rate environment actually does influence our risk-taking decision. Do we want to be a passive investor or do we want to be an entrepreneur? And my last point really is what is the role of policy and where to from here? I think in Singapore's case, um, the very broad-based job support scheme that has been rolled out was actually very effective in trying to stave off the sharp rise in the local unemployment rates last year but it may also have given rise to a perception that the government can and should continue to subsidize local employment. Therefore, I think it may be necessary to quickly migrate to other forms of support. And so I'm very heartened to see that the job support initiative being put in place. I think conversely, if you look at the wish list from the business side of things, they are hoping for foreign worker levy rebates for certain sectors but this will raise hard questions about, is it the government's role to do so? I think more should be done to actually encourage the SMEs to migrate to digital platforms and to diversify their markets and sourcing strategy. So when the next economic or health crisis comes, they will actually be more prepared and positioned for the onslaught of challenges. So one question that's very close to my heart is this, how can we better support and prepare workers for this new normal in a post COVID environment? My sense is that the man on the street knows that they need to upgrade and upskill. They know of the need to have lifelong learning, but they may still be quite uncertain about how to do it. You hear so much noise about the digital economy, the need for programming and coding skills and preparing for the new normal. But exactly how do you translate that to the here and now? I think that's still a mystery to some. And I think particularly for the older workers and maybe even some PMETs, so while we have the Skills Future Initiative, which is a very good and encouraging start, I think what I would like to propose is that maybe you can consider some guidelines and reference benchmarks. We have this industry transformation map, ITM for short, to guide firms within sectors on how to grow and diversify. We could have an equivalent for workers in particular industries. Where do they get from point to point as they progress in their career? So getting feedback, I think, from the workers on what HR or training changes they would like to see, that they will empower them to actually craft out your own learning journey, and also give fresh graduates you know, and existing workers a sense of achieving their career destinations. I think that will go a long way to actually ensuring that uh, you know, the Skills Future Fund is actually fully utilized and put to a good start, apart from you know, having those nice to have causes like gardening or baking, for instance. There was a lot of thought given to you know, tackling the skills mismatch gap. Well, having a skills anticipation strategy requires quite forward thinking on the part of policymakers. I think they have to adapt not only to the changes in the industries and sectors and trade, but also for technology and even environmental policies. So there has been some mention about the progressive wage uh, scheme, uh, the model that is a uh, minimum wage plus. I'm quite ambivalent between the two. Um, my concern as economists is really in terms of financing and implementation. But I think what is quite clear is that the pace really has to uh, be accelerated. So how to accelerate and protect them, all vulnerable segments of the Singapore workers probably will need some out of the box thinking itself. I think at the heart, 
of this polarization and populism that we see globally is the sense that you know there is growing income inequality despite globalization and the fruits of the economic uh, growth has not fully trickled down to the lower uh, percentage uh, percentile of workers. So I just want to give some kudos to the Singapore government because if you look at the combination of the workfare income supplement and the special handouts, actually they did manage to keep the income levels of the lowest bottom percentile of the Singaporean workers in 2020, quite similar to 2019. But it did come, I think, at a significant fiscal cost as well. So going forward, I think the, the, the rationale for building the Singapore core, that's the vision. But we need to be a little bit wary about being seen as potentially discriminatory as well. So we have all these concerns globally about economic nationalism and populism. How do we translate our manpower policies into something that is acceptable and seen as forward looking, I think would be also important going forward. So let me sum up in conclusion. I think firstly, the pandemic has obviously thrown up a lot of lessons of what we do, how can we do better, and what should we prepare for in terms of the next crisis? Secondly, it's quite clear it's going to be a partnership. You need to take into account all the different stakeholders, be they the private sector, the policy makers, the workers themselves, the institutes of higher learning. Um, you do need a buy-in and a sense of ownership. And last but not least, I think policy really does make a real difference to the workers, especially for the low-income workers. And I think going forward, the challenge, of course, is to strike a balance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selena. Excellent. Wonderful detail from on the ground on what's happening in Singapore's labor markets. Now, there are a lot of questions that have come in. We won't necessarily be able to get to all of them, but I'd like to try and organize them in themes. And the theme I'd like to begin with is a conceptual one. Uh, SM Talman described the vision of policy in labor markets, in, in jobs and skills that was uh, interventionist in some ways, sort of revealing of, of natural spontaneous forces in other ways, sort of a, a good marrying of the forces. Tyler described a different vision of, of a, a marketplace where there are self-organizers and they are not. And that disruption rides on leverages on the changes that COVID-19 have wrought. That's one set of issues that I want us to talk about, the conceptual. And then after that, I want to turn to some of the distributional impacts that are specific to the Singapore labor market. But let me begin, if I may, to ask, invite uh, CN Mr. Taman, to, for his reactions to the vision that Tyler has described of, of modern labor markets. Over to you, Senior Minister. Thanks very much, Danny. Uh, first, by the way, a, um, a minor correction because I misspoke earlier uh, when I spoke about um, us wanting not just a minimum wage, but maximum employment. I said maximum unemployment by mistake. Uh, which I'm sure was obvious, but uh, in case it wasn't, let me just put that right. Minimum wage, maximum employment, particularly for our most vulnerable uh, workers. Um, a second, I just want to mention, by the way, that Selena's point about um, developing skills framework that match our industry transformation maps, that actually exists. And in fact, uh, it's been something we've been uh, working over the years. And in fact, it's very much now in a phase of implementation sector by sector. I was just, as you're speaking, looking through the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the websites and the programs that deal with it. It starts with career pathways. It moves on to the occupational and job descriptions. It moves on to the skills descriptions. And then it moves on to the training programs for those specific skills. So it's uh, uh, continuous work, but it involves very importantly, career coaching and skills coaching. And that's the basic soft infrastructure that we're developing uh, in the system. So you're very much on mark in, in pointing to that need and it's something that's uh, well underway. Um, coming to Danny's broader point, uh, I would say that uh, I think uh, economists by and large uh, would agree that wages are set by a combination of market forces, uh, bargaining power and institutions and norms. Uh, that's the new consensus, I would say. 
uh, in the old textbooks, uh, wages were uh, equal to marginal productivity, but no one knows how to measure the marginal productivity of each and every individual worker. And in practice, demand and supply plays a major role. Um, markets do determine wages, but they do not determine it uh, independently uh, of the bargaining power of workers, unionized or non-unionized, they do not determine it independently of the structure of the labor market. So it's been found increasingly across a range of sectors internationally, this is true in the United States, it's true everywhere, that in some sectors you have a, a monopsonic um, structure. Uh, workers don't have that much choice as to which employer to work for. And this is true even in the gig economy, by the way. So uh, wage setting is not simply a matter of individual uh, 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 market forces uh, between a mass of individual workers and a mass of companies, but it's also determined by uh, labor market structure. In other words, labor markets are imperfect. And that imperfection can allow for certain jobs to be paid lower than what they are worth. And the scope for collective solutions, institutional interventions, to raise wages without losing jobs uh, does exist. How to go about it is a challenge. And that's what I was talking about it. You've got to go about it in a calibrated way and make sure that we know who the least skilled are and the most vulnerable are and ensure that the solutions we've embarked on, both with regard to the pace of introduction as well as the design of those solutions will result in them having better prospects at work, rather than being either left out of work or with shortened hours and so on and so forth. If you look at the experience um, of some other countries, um, I don't want to knock the idea of an across the board minimum wage, but it has great complexity. If you look at Hong Kong and Korea, for instance, Hong Kong went for a uh, minimum wage set at $37.50 Hong Kong dollars, um, not very high at all. In fact, it covers only 1% of the eligible workforce. Korea went for a much more ambitious target. It was a political ambition. Uh, they went for a high minimum wage target and they've now had to retreat. In fact, the government issued an apol apology this year for the significant disruption that it has caused to the SME sector and to lower income earner, earners. In fact, in the last two years, the lower deciles of the Korean workforce have faced a decline in earnings because of shortened hours. So it's a complicated matter. I think the minimum wage does address the need for collective solutions, but how you go about it is critical. And we are going about it sector by sector using the progressive wage model and providing for some skills progression on the job as well. And we're going about it in a way that's tailored to the least skilled, helping them to keep their jobs and if possible to upgrade. That I think is a solution that will get us to the same end point, but without major risk to those who are least able to bear it. Thank you. Thank you, SM. Tyler, I want to bring you into the conversation with, uh, with Senior Minister. Um, uh, one of the references that Senior Minister made was to the gig economy. And while there is sort of a romantic image that the gig economy is just sort of, you know, one person and their bicycle or just one person and their Mac carving out new, new segments of wonderful code. It is also the case that the gig economy is a process of co-production of people getting together into spontaneously emerging firms. I wonder how you square that part of reality with your vision of uh, self-organizers. I think if you are working in the gig economy, the biggest risk you face is you may not be on very good career ladders. Ask some simple question. Who is your mentor? Who is training you on the job? What is the small group surrounding you you bounce ideas off or learn from. Now, some gig jobs are fantastic. You're a consultant, 
you come in, you're a small team, maybe someone on your team wants to hire you a year later. Most big jobs are not that. So my biggest worry about temporary labor is the trajectory of our imagined vision of where those jobs lead is too short term. The one nice feature of the older US manufacturing economy is there was a, a career ladder, a promotion ladder you had. And even if the final step along that ladder was not a very high wage by current standards, there was a structure, there was something you could look forward to. You had a peer group, it also just regulated your behavior and kept you from falling off the wagon, as we would say. So I get that the gig economy is necessary. We need many of those jobs. I don't think it's actually by and large the answer to our labor market problem. Okay, thank you very much. There are a pair of leading questions in the, in the list of questions that have been submitted. And what's interesting about this pair is that they treat different parts of the labor market co-equally. One question is about the young people in the labor market, and the other question is about the old people in the labor market. And there's co-equal interest in the two parts of this distribution. So this is something that I want you know, all three to speak to, but in particular, Selena and SM Tarman, both of you have spoken about this. Across the world, in most other economies, the empirical regularity is that youth unemployment rates are double, double the overall unemployment rate. So whether you go to the Middle East, you go to the United States, Great Britain, Western Europe, the stylized fact is youth are unemployed at double the rate that everybody else is. In Singapore, it's the regularity moves in the opposite direction. One of the facts that SM Tarman described was how if you look at the bottom 10% of wage earners, you know, over half of those are the older people, are the older workers. So there's this tension in the parts of the labor market that we want to look at. And that tension is reflected in these two questions that I'm gonna pull out. So again, for all three, but you know, to, to pick up on Selena first and then SM Tarman, what guidance, the first question, what guidance would you give the younger generation of Singaporeans, the 12 to 18 year olds regarding the skills that they will need to have to make them competitive in the future. So this is guidance to the young about skills for the future. The other question, which has an equal number of votes is about the old people. How might we change the social narrative around aging and address the mismatch in the skills of our seniors to improve their productive capacity in the future economy. So again, both of these questions about the future economy, both what we need to do about the labor market. One question is about the young, the other question is about the old. Selena, can I get you to open up and then I'm gonna to turn to our two other, to our two panelists. Okay, sure. Actually, these two questions are also very close to my heart. I think the guidance to younger people, I, I have uh, teenage children and they are on the brink of choosing causes of study. And during this period when, you know, uh, they have some time to think about it and also to, to take jobs, you know, I, I do try and give them some advice of whether they should go for internships, apprenticeships, or even do some online courses. So I think those are actually quite critical to get a sense of what the workplace actually requires. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a specific uh, line of field, but I think it's to get on the job experience, you know, to figure out what employers are looking for. Because like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times, the soft skills, the EQ, the ability to adapt in the workplace, these are not things that you learn through school or through uh, home-based learning, for instance. So I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, yes, academic qualifications are important. Yes, you do need some of that programming, coding, digital skills, which I think actually the younger people in uh, Singapore context, I think the education system actually prepares them quite well for that. My worry is really more for people in our vintage, you know, uh, having to pick up new digital skills as we progress, uh, as we do career shifts, for instance. So young people is very uh, relatively easy recipe, I would say. Get as much on the ground experience in touch with employers, whether it's through internships, through traineeships, through apprenticeships, get as much experience, real life experience as possible. 
For older workers, I think the transition is a little bit harder. Um, like what Prof. Tyler said, a lot of the things we learn in school, they are completely obsolete, right? So you really have to start from a zero base. Surrounding yourself with younger workers actually do help to a certain extent. You get quite in sync with what they're looking out for. Um, I think being on your toes all the time, um, trying to learn what's forefront in terms of the winds of change in your industry helps. The financial sector, for instance, is always evolving very, very rapidly. Um, I do tell the fresh graduates who are trying to join the financial industry, you know, if you don't have that quantitative skills, it's very difficult to step in. But I also do tell mid-career, you know, uh, entrants that your current skill sets is important, but how do you translate that from your current job to this job, being able to articulate how you would actually bring value add to the job? That's something that school doesn't teach you for. So like I mentioned, you have to use your skills future. You do have to think very hard about what are the career transitions that it's upcoming. You have to anticipate um, having your government or your employer do it for you is easy. Being a self-starter to think about it yourself is hard. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. SM Tarman, can I get your views on these two, you know, very different parts of the Singapore labor market and, and your ideas on policies for this? Well, I think um, both ends of that um, demographic uh, spectrum are very important to us. Uh, we've managed to avoid uh, in past crises, uh, permanent disadvantage for younger entrants who, had, who come into the workforce at the wrong time unlucky cohorts. Uh, they suffer a short-term knock, but they were able to bounce back and be get back onto, onto the same trajectory as previous cohorts were able to do. So if you look at the generation that graduated around the time of the global financial crisis, they've done fine. Um, and the same was true for those that came into the market at the time of the Asian crisis, or even our 1985 crisis. Big short-term uh, pain, but they were able to bounce back up. The key is that we've got to have a system where everyone keeps adapting and learning. And I'm confident that our young can do so. Don't expect a job that is exactly what you thought you were going to do when you were studying. Uh, get into the market and learn as much as you can. I'm more concerned about our mature workforce. They're hardworking people. They're people who want to contribute. And I think we still have some ways to go in having an employment market that takes our mature workers seriously. The issue is not just about skills mismatch. It's about a willingness to be able to hire and reskill and upskill someone who already has significant skills. It's never a perfect match. It's never that way. Uh, in labor markets. You never get a perfect match of, of skills, except for certain very few uh, specialized jobs. In general, you hire someone, you train them up, and they, they have to adapt. And it can be done. I think we still have a bias against our mature workers, and employers have to take the high road. Employers have to take the high road take advantage of the government schemes to hire our mature Singaporeans, take advantage of the very significant subsidies for training. And I'm confident that we'll find a way in which you're helping not just the individuals who are looking for jobs, but also we'll end up helping the firms themselves in a very tight labor market. We're not going to loosen up on foreign worker policy, quite the opposite. So make the most of our Singapore workforce. They have people with experience, with a willingness to work hard and a willingness to learn. And that's why we've slanted our incentives towards the mature workers. The job growth initi incentive, job growth in in initiative pays 50% of the wages for the first year. Skills training by employers, the government pays 90%. And the skills future credit for the individuals, mature Singaporeans, those above 40 in fact, got a $1,000 top up on top of the previous $500. So we are providing very strong government incentive, but it requires a change of attitude 
and it requires some new heart towards our mature workers. Thank, thank you, Senior Minister. In your answer, you also uh, have uh, addressed another question on the same topic, which was about how there is a pervasive sense of insecurity among the local workforce, especially for those 45 and above. And I'm sure your words come as, as assurance on the things that are being done and your vision for how we're gonna to continue to improve that situation. Thank you very much. I want Tyler to also to pick up on the same issue, but there is also a question that's come in that's specifically directed at the points that you've made, Tyler, on, on this part of the labor market, which is that you know you've 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 described the you know if you want you should also speak to the the young and the old as Selena and SM Tarman have already done, but there's a question about. Um, your observations on the state of, of, of Singapore entrepreneurship, your observations about where the, pre, where the, the great mass of self-organizers rest in the world. What can Singapore do to bring about, to encourage the Elon Musks and the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world that you think we should be doing more of if we're not already? Let me start <clears throat> with the old and the young. <clears throat> it's so different for America and for Singapore. So my advice to the young is don't sell drugs. And youth unemployment measures as higher here, but so many of those people are in the underground economy. Add for career ladders. Obviously, there's some appeal. The older people, it's also so different. The average conscientiousness much higher in Singapore, in my opinion. In the United States, especially the young people, these people with buffalo horns who invade the Capitol, mm. you know, you hire them, they don't show up for work half the time. So if you're in a human resources department for a basic service job and an older person walks in the door, you grab them, you hire them right away because you know they've passed some kind of survival test. They're not in jail, they're still alive, they're probably not on drugs. So our elderly, even if their human capital is not so impressive, they can walk into a stable situation much more easily because a lot of the rest of the workforce has a conscientiousness effect. <clears throat> now, entrepreneurship in Singapore. I have a very contrarian opinion here. I think Singapore is one of the most entrepreneurial places in the world. You're looking for it in the wrong places and you describe yourselves incorrectly. Don't think you'll ever have an Elon Musk. He's not your style, right? Just think of that stuff he says on Twitter about the regulators. How's that going to fly in Singapore, right? Not really. Mark Zuckerberg, I don't know. But the core Singaporean startup is the Singaporean state, which has the most talented, most cohesive civil service in the world, including many of you. No one else has created anything like that. It was a phenomenal and ongoing act of entrepreneurship. And if you think of it in those terms, you will realize there is no entrepreneurial deficit in Singapore right now. You just are using the terms in a very narrow way. That said, of course, you'd be happy to have more tech startups. You're, you know, the pricey land is a problem. Uh, I think Singaporean society is in some ways too conformist be the land even of Mark Zuckerberg, much less Elon Musk. So take what you can get on that front. I think on like predictability, rule of law, quality of governance, it's extraordinarily entrepreneurial what you've been doing for decades. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. I would like to build on what Tyler has just said about entrepreneurial activity, because, you know, he's given you know, the, the state, the civil service, the public service, public servants generally, the credit, you know, that he's described for the taking the economy and society forwards in entrepreneurial ways. That's wonderful to hear. In addition, of course, there's also private sector entrepreneurship. And a question that's come in is, how do you see the future of the sources of job creation? Will they continue to rest in one or the other of multinational corporations, large companies, small and medium enterprises? Given your answer, what do we do to encourage entrepreneurship 
to make sure that we take forward this creation of good and productive jobs. Can I turn to Senior Minister uh, to begin our, our addressing this point, please? Well, let me uh, uh, add to what has already been said, including what Tyler uh, just spoke about. Um, we all start from uh, different histories. Uh, Singapore had a strategy that uh, had significant reliance on multinationals in manufacturing and finance and in some other sectors for a good part of its history. It succeeded in creating jobs very quickly and in raising incomes very quickly. It was a somewhat different strategy compared to Korea and Taiwan and Japan, uh, but it worked. We are all evolving, but we're not trying to replicate someone else's model because we are evolving out of different histories. Uh, I do think there's scope for more individual exceptionalism in Singapore, uh, and we want more of it. It starts young, but it's also the way in which companies operate. And that individual exceptionalism is needed for the future to complement the system exceptionalism that we have, that system entrepreneurship that Singapore is well known for. Uh, I do think that our local companies are coming into their own uh, as innovators and as leaders in Asia. Uh, I mentioned earlier the you know, range of multinationals that are doing a whole span of activities in Singapore. They're at the forefront internationally, but very importantly for the future. Uh, we need that solid core of local companies that are in the innovation space, creating good jobs up and down the ladder. And that complement of local and foreign, I think, will serve us uh, well in future. But I do want to come back also to Tyler's point about the uh, political economy, if you like, uh, of prosperity. Uh, anyone looking at the uh, mob that uh, raided the, the Capitol in the United States would have uh, discerned very quickly that they were not poor people. Uh, in fact, most commentators assess that they were probably above average socioeconomic status. But let's just say they were somewhere in the broad middle. Uh, and we know that the broad middle uh, hasn't seen much uplift in their standard of living for a long time in a whole range of advanced countries. Uh, there's been stagnation for a very long period of time. And you don't have to be a sociologist or social psychologist to know that when people are stuck in the same place for a long time, they get very anxious about relative positions, how they stand relative to those who are catching up from below, as well as how they stand relative to those who are further up the ladder from them. And we've got, the, we've got to ensure that everyone is moving up. We've got to ensure that moving escalator that takes everyone up, because it also allows for an exchange of places on the escalator. It allows for more social mobility without people feeling deeply anxious. So I'm not trying to give an explanation for a mob raiding the capital, but I'm pointing to a broader economic and social fact and what we must avoid, which is that through all our strategies, entrepreneurship, skills upgrading, job matching, our economic strategies, we've got to ensure that the broad middle in society is doing well feels at ease and is willing to support policies and strategies that strengthen solidarity, including doing more to help those who are at the bottom. Okay, thank you. This is the, the problem of the, the sandwiched middle as they get squeezed more and more and feel more and more left behind. There's a, a, a new force a political, potent political force that emerges from that group. And that, you know, we, in our discussion of labor markets we and entrepreneurship, 
focusing on different parts of the population, we should be careful. It would be remiss to forget them, to ignore them. Thank you very much for bringing that out, Senior Minister. The, Selena, can I get you to, to come in on this, first the sources of entrepreneurship, but also if you wish, this idea of that, that SM has, has brought into our conversation, the sandwich middle. Selena. Well, I think in terms of the sources of entrepreneurship, um, if you look uh, in the historical context, like as I mentioned, we really started with foreign direct investments and MNCs. And I think to a large extent that uh, strategy has evolved. I think building up the local ecosystems, bringing up the SMEs to actually, uh, you know, to regionalize and to go overseas. I think that's a very critical part of ensuring the stability of the Singapore economy. So I'm quite hopeful, actually. I think the SMEs within the SMEs themselves, uh, you do have a certain tier of SMEs that are on par with some of the regional uh, peers as well. So it's not that there is a lack of local entrepreneurship per se, but I guess at the end of the day is the balance, right? You want to ensure that there is more local entrepreneurs and more local entrepreneurial startups that actually continue to fledge you know, their muscles and to grow into potential unicorns to come. So maybe we don't have an Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg at this juncture, but hopefully all the money they are pouring into R&D uh, will pay off. Maybe in a decade or two, we will have the equivalence of our own Singaporean unicorns. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, Thank yeah, you. the second part Sorry, of the question ahead. is... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the second part was whether you wanted to speak on this, this problem of the sandwich middle. That, uh, that senior minister has introduced into our conversation. Do you see that as something that's actually happening in your conversations with industries and with, with, uh, with new job entrants? I think that the middle class squeeze probably is not unique to Singapore per se, mm. but I would say that the, in a Singaporean context, the policymakers have been quite innovative about it. Mm. Because when I look at the budgets and the extent of the fiscal support and assistance that has been given um, it has branched out from being targeted at really the bottom decile or quintile of the population. Mm. Uh, some of the assistants are really going to white collar workers, to the middle class as well. That comes in the form of you know baby bonus support, um, even in terms of the uh, you know the jobs growth initiative that's going into to the older workers and including the PMETs. And if you look at the job support scheme last year, right, even self employed people and uh, white collar uh, people did also get the support. So I would say that we have evolved in terms of our fiscal approach, such that it's not just about taxing the top quintile to support the bottom quintile, but it's a very much whole of society approach, I would say. And I think that's really what would carry on and probably underpin the Singapore growth model in a very sustainable way going forward. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lena. SM, did you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah please. Just, just, just to uh, uh, make the point that we're not starting from a bad place in Singapore when it comes to the middle income group, because mm. we have seen a very significant lift in incomes. Mm. In fact, mm. uh, almost uniquely in the advanced world, mm. a 65% increase in real terms exactly. over the last two decades. Exactly. Uh, that has now taken median wages to one of the highest in the advanced exactly. world in real terms. Exactly. So, but we've got to sustain that. We are exposed to the same challenges that all advanced countries face, the challenges of increased automation, digitization, and increased risk of global outsourcing of even knowledge-based jobs. And that's what we've got to deal with. Exactly. Thank you, Senior Minister, because you had mentioned that, that point earlier about the 65% rise of the median uh, individual in our wage distribution. Thank you very much for emphasizing that. We've come to the end of our session, uh, but can I just uh, uh, beg your forgiveness and ask you one very last question to get your thoughts, and then I'm going to have to close up, but there's a lot of questions coming in on this. And this is, as we talk about taking care of the old, taking care of the young, taking care of the entrepreneurs, the uh, creating an environment for self-organizers and entrepreneurs, what should we be thinking about when we look for when we look ahead to the new job market of the future in how it deals with persons with disabilities or persons that you know otherwise have stereotypes wrecked against them what do we need to do to make sure that this really is bringing on 
all of our labor force. Can I go in the direction where Selena, Tyler, and that's Senior Minister Taman, and then I'm going to have to, to end this. Selena. Okay, sure. Um, I think it's back to mindsets again. Um, employers, I mean, uh, there was an allusion to, you know, having the ages mindset among employers that will have to change. I think the Singapore's mes uh, government's messaging is very important. The foreign worker labor policy will stay. That means you really have to maximize and utilize all the different segments of the Singapore workforce, the local workforce. So be they, uh, you know, the youth, the older workers, or even uh, those with uh, disabilities, I think employers' mindsets have to change. And I think actually the silver lining in this whole COVID crisis is that you realize that not all the jobs have to be done on the work site or in the office. A lot of things can actually be done remotely. And I think that opens up a lot of opportunities for everyone. Thank you very much, Lena. Tyler. Well, if this is a question about Singapore, I think of political stability as being of the utmost importance for a small country surrounded by potential enemies. And you have a high percentage of foreigners entering your country, uh, many from mainland China, and just making sure that culturally they truly become Singaporeans, which is non-trivial. I think if you can manage that on an ongoing basis, you will succeed at all the other problems. But I know that's not exactly the question you posed. Nope, but your economy will work well enough Real question is with that ratio of recent arrivals to natives, can you make them true Singaporeans? And yes, the Chinese from mainland, they sort of look like Singaporeans. So actually they don't, you can tell, like at the counter, if it's someone from mainland waiting on you, there are these indescribable differences. So can you succeed at that new project? Strikes me as a key question at the heart of the Singaporean enterprise. Thank you very much, Tyler. Senior Minister, to close out. Well, I think COVID has, one of the silver linings of COVID has been the uh, greater recognition of the contributions of our essential workers and blue collar workers generally. We've got to take advantage of that renewed spirit of solidarity as we go forward. We need more individual exceptionalism, we need more entrepreneurship, we need more innovation in every sector of our society. But we can do that with a strong sense amongst everyone that we are in this together. And at the end of the day, we are our brother's keepers. Thank you very much, Senior Minister. We've come to the end of, of this session. I'm afraid I'm, I will have to close this out now. We began with a rather tense uh, scenario when we talked about how COVID had hit us in the midst of all these other great disruptions. Uh, the challenges were immense and severe. And what we do now is going to be so consequential for how the global economy and all our societies will function going into the future. But I hope this audience will agree with me that the interlocutors among our panelists and our discussion and the questions that we've gotten from the audience have actually given a wonderful ray of optimism about all the different ways in which we can actually all become better and safer. So I want to thank everyone uh, for being in this session. I want to thank IPS for having put this session, wonderful session together. Uh, I hope you will all join me in your, wherever you are tuning in from, in giving a round of applause to our speakers. Let me hand back to Chris and IPS. Chris, back to you. Thank you. May we convey our thanks to Professor Danny Kwa for so ably moderating the session. And we'd like to thank the panelists, SM Tarman, Prof Tyler Cohen and Ms. Lena Ling and all of you for joining in and contributing to the discussion. Do continue to post your comments on the session's topic of jobs and skills in the conference chat, as we will be taking all of your inputs today onto our final day of plenary sessions on the 25th of January, as well as to the IPS Reimagining Singapore 2030 project. We now take a break. Our next session is on environment and sustainability and will begin at 4 p.m. Singapore time later today. We look forward to seeing you then. Until then, have a good day. Thanks very much. Thanks, Harman, Tyler, Selena. Wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you all so much. Thank you. See Thank you all you. later.